Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Nancy Farrako. I'm the chapter rep. And we have a really exciting night tonight. We have our interns from the Norris Lab joining us tonight, so that's exciting. And we have a, a really good lecture ahead of us. We also have um, a patient who's going to speak about his experience with uh, endocrinology issues. Uh, but before we get all that started, we're just going to have a few words from the Bobby Jones Chiari Syringo Myelia Foundation. <laughs> I promise I will keep this brief, everyone. Um, we actually have a request from all, for all of you. Uh, so we are in the process of developing our research priority areas. Uh, we really want to make sure that these are uh, patient and caregiver driven and very centered on what patients and caregivers actually want. So in order to do that, um, just as a brief background, our registry is getting an overhaul and we talked about it a little bit last time when we were here. I'm Caitlin, by the way, I did not introduce myself. <laughs> Caitlin Esposito from the Bobby Jones CSF. Um, so last time we were here, we talked about our registry getting a bit of an overhaul. We have an exciting new opportunity. So one thing that we wanted to do um, was really go through one of the things that we had already kind of planned for and use that project to better prioritize our research and hopefully if we are able to complete a white paper, maybe others, other people's research as well, to really make sure that we're focusing on areas that are not really being covered at the moment. So that's what we're doing in this interim period. Oh, that got ugly, but <laughs> we're gonna need family members that are impacted to speak to the issues that are mattering most to them, is what that should say, and it was going to be underlined, but you know. Um, so obviously by the end of the year, we're trying to develop 2024 research priority areas for our registry as we prepare to incorporate more academic centers into this work and different data streams um, using different technological advances, hopefully. To do that, uh, we're going to need some people, and we're going to want as close to an even split as possible, and I'll explain what I mean by that. We're going to want adults and children, so people who have the experience of having a child with these disorders or living themselves day to day as an adult. And then as far as the disorders themselves, I want as broad a swath as possible. So I want people who are strict Chiari, they just they go in, they get a decompression, they come back out and they say, all right, that was my situation. It's people with syringomyelia only, if possible. Obviously, this is an EDS heavy area, so we really wanna make sure we include the Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome viewpoint as well. And then any variety of other comorbidities and different mix and matches, basically, of different um, patients that we've got. Um, and then, just so you know what to expect, since we are asking this of you, thank you very much. Uh, they will be semi-structured virtual interviews, ranging anywhere from 30 to 90 minutes, depending on how much you have to say. So it will be a one-on-one -on -one with a patient advocate who's going to be really handling most of the mathematics on the end of this. So they're going to talk to you, just open forum, just really open-ended questions. Um, we're going to need 10 to 15 families. <clears throat> And that initial interview is going to be done within really the span of one week so that one interviewer doesn't kind of get biased in how they ask those questions um, over time. Um, they're going to ask you questions about your experience, so your diagnos diagnosis, uh, treatment, quality of life. It's going to include things that we talked about in the uh, support meeting today, so stuff from school, work, um, your diet, nutrition, anything that really impacts your day. And then what's going to happen in those initial interviews, they're going to be transcribed. And natural language processing is going to be used to develop a specific type of score. And those scores are going to help us develop topic, topic areas. Then they'll get bucketed together. And then there will be a follow-up survey, which may or may not include you again or new people to kind of get their input as well to get more power. Um, and then from there, we're going to be ranking those areas. So it could be anything as varied as utility of specific diagnostic tests, 
the different treatments available that are not surgical, um, or even just being able to navigate the medical system. It's going to really depend on those 10 to 15 initial interviews. So it's really an important part of this process. Um, but essentially, we're going to want to know these two things. So one, whatever those topics are, how important are those things to you? And how satisfied are you with the current state of those things? So um, that follow-up interview will really get into whether or not where, where those things are priority-wise. <clears throat> and then the final product, we're going to be able to systematically uh, point to specific things that are not being adequately addressed right now in the medical literature. So what we're, again, trying to do is try to write some white paper up, make sure that um, areas like here, like MUSC, are obviously focusing on these things and that we are focusing on these things as we expand our registry as well. So if you're interested, <laughs> this is my information. Take a screenshot if you want to take a picture of it. Uh, again, we're going to want 10 to 15 families, ideally, and we really want a big swath of people who are able to speak to their own experience and really point us in the right direction about where we should be looking um, in, as far as what matters to you all. So before we get too far down the road. <laughs> um, but that's all. So thank you. So I have a quick question. Of course. So. Um, it's Chiari only, Syringomyelia only, and Ellis Th Those were just only. examples. Um, I'd oh, like okay. to have those, but okay. if we have people who are more complex, so be it. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> Ellis Danlos, there's usually a lot that comes along with that. Other, so it's yeah. not like just Ellis Danlos typically. <laughs> no, totally understand. Okay. Yeah, we, we want to make sure. I'm just going to pull it up because that's fine. <laughs> We okay. want to make sure we're being as inclusive as possible about the different um, patient groups that are going to be impacted by this stuff. So, okay. Just trying to... All right. Thank you. Thank you. So everybody, help us out. <laughs> I also want to point out that September twenty eighth is our um, our Unite for Answers walk. Um, any of you who don't know what it is, haven't participated in the fa in the past. It's a lot of fun. We, uh, we have music, we have little games, and it's a time for you to just come and, and chill and get together with other people who, who, who get it. You know, they're just like you and, and going through all this, these problems. And for one day, you can just go out and not think about your problems and meet other people and have a good time. Um, it ends with a walk, a one-mile walk that is um, wheelchair accessible. You don't have to do it if you're not able or you don't want to, but uh, we do a walk and uh, we ask people to raise a team. Um, if you could raise your team, you can get some kind of cute name for your team if you want. And ask your friends and family to sponsor you on your team. And that way we, we raise money for the Bobby Jones CSF. They do all these wonderful things, all this wonderful research, and, and sponsor meetings like this. And there's so much that you don't see that they do. I have a couple of um, posters back there showing some of the things. Um, so, of course, they need money. And this is our way to show them we appreciate you. We're going to ask our friends and family to help support you so that they can continue doing these things. Um, so I hope everybody will put it on their calendar and plan to join us. Pam runs a walk up in Richmond, Virginia. So she's the chairman for the walk up there. So if you don't live in this area and you're up closer to there, you might want to look Pam up and join her. So. Uh, just wanted to say that. Um, we have a special patient tonight who's going to talk about some of the issues he's had with his endocrine system, um, the topic of the night. He's had, he's had all kinds of issues other than that, but tonight we're focusing on that. Um, it's Roman Fenner. Come on up, Roman. He is an MD, PhD student here. And he was one of the first interns here in the Norris lab. 
So it's great to have them hanging out here. Thank you so, so much, Nancy. Thank you for doing this. <laughs> okay, Roman, let's right. hear it. <laughs> it's an honor. Thank you, Nancy, and the rest of Bobby Jones CSF for having me here tonight. Um, thank you all for showing up. And congrats to the interns. It was really exciting to be in your place a couple of years ago, and it's been really incredible to see where that experience took me to where I am now as an MD PhD student here. I just finished up my first year, and I'm currently wrapping up my first half of medical school, and then I'll do my PhD, finish up medical school, and hopefully have a lifelong career treating EDS patients. So it's been really exciting, but it's a difficult journey, as you know, all of us know what that is. And whether it's EDS, Chiari, Sergamayoya, CCI, or all of it, um, we know that this is a multi-systemic disorder, and a lot of us in this room probably see specialists all over. I know some of you might just be coming down here because you have an appointment with a specialist um, and you drove or flew a really far distance. So we have this, you know, for the, those of us that are fortunate to have a care team, we have the neurological aspects like CCI, Chiari, tethered cord or cardiovascular system issues like POTS, uh, mitral valve prolapse, allergy and immunology, mast cell activation syndrome, gastrointestinal with hernias, gastroparesis, um, orthopedics, like you can just keep going down the list of organ systems where EDS affects you. So why don't we talk about the endocrine system? I guess that's the whole purpose of tonight. It's a very important system and in many ways um, we can draw connections to it from all the other systems that I touched on. So, you know, I just want to mention that we have this intrinsic connection and many of us in this room probably have already dealt with endocrine issues, whether that's adrenal insufficiency or PCOS or um, pituitary cyst, pineal cyst, like you, you name it, um, common things that you might hear about every day, but with our presentation, we might never hear answers if we're not seeing an expert. So it's a, it's a really tough thing to add into the mix. So I'm gonna share just some snapshots of my patient journey with um, endocrinology-based issues um, and my allergy downloads. It's not gonna be the, the 10 brain and spine surgeries I had in a year period in high school. That's all for a different day. So endocrine, um, from day one in my family, that was um, the first thing I presented. I was about three years old when I had hypoglycemia that no doctor could figure the cause for. And uh, prior to any other forms of diagnosis or illness in my family, it was something that was really difficult and shocking as a kid to have to learn from preschool age how to check your blood sugar three times a day and always have to eat snacks and maintain all that. And then going from doctor to doctor being told, we don't really believe you. It's not in our medical textbook, to, to quote one doctor that we saw. Um, so it took 13 years to finally develop a diagnosis. And during that 13 year period, at one point, um, my younger sister was born and had tethered cord syndrome, and that led to all of us getting diagnosed with hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos. And so down the line of brain and spine surgeries and like you, you name it, um, going from doctor to doctor attempting to get answers, I finally got treatment for my hypoglycemia. Endocrine kind of took the back seat. EDS, all the deathly things that we were dealing with, you know, took paramount. And then a couple years later, in 2017, um, my sister Eden and I both kind of went through the ringer. Um, from surgical complications, I had septic shock. And surviving that, you know, you survive that, no one makes it out unscathed, and you have lasting issues. And after that, I started to develop the strange discoloration of my skin in certain areas. Um, any really stressful events would like make my heart rate get crazy and I would just feel super faint, my back would hurt really bad, my mood would change. Really weird stuff that over the years got progressively worse and um, developed into really debilitating symptoms that one day, and I'll touch on, led to an adrenal crisis, which eventually led me to Dr. Matthews and getting a diagnosis. But around that same time in 2017, my sister Eden was having a neurosurgery and she wouldn't wake up from her surgery. And the residents, um, to quote, said, she's just a little tuckered out, she'll be okay. And the endocrinology team gets paged and they find out her cortisol was less than one. So she was put on steroids for life and she's, I guess, you know, found a lot of improvement in that. And that put on our radar 
what is adrenal insufficiency? How does cortisol fit into the mix of EDS? And for many years, it was, we don't know. And for a lot of our doctors, it was, we don't know. It was a lot of testing, 8 a.m. cortisol draws with symptoms like, like, like vomiting, falling asleep mid-sentence, and then you get a regular number, and it's like, we don't know what to do, which is really frustrating, because when you live with these conditions, um, just to get diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos, I'm sure a lot of us know, you kind of aren't validated, you look normal, and you're not really believed, and um, there aren't tests or other measures that can be given to really find what's causing those severe symptoms. So reliving that experience really, in a way, felt like reliving that early childhood of seeing my family, you know, just have no luck in getting a diagnosis and suffering. But there's a lot of hope, and uh, this was, was last year at one of the talks was kind of the focus, hope on the horizon with regards to ehlers downlos research, um, things that will impact Heather Cord, Chiari, Suru Myoya, like the research that the foundation is doing now. Um, that's something you know. I find a lot of hope in too. Is this is the first time I think we've had an endocrinologist speak on these conditions and their connections in a lecture like this, which I think is huge. And it's not just any endocrinologist; it's it's my endocrinologist, but also an expert in these conditions, which is really something that's remarkable. Because um, uh, as a medical student in the uh, the spring semester, our last unit was the endocrine system. And we learned almost day one, you know, how to spot adrenal insufficiency, know the different types between primary and secondary. Is it the gland or is it the brain? These are the tests that you do. And um, it was so obvious, I guess, for us, you know, getting this more up-to-date education. But for a lot of physicians that we had seen prior, they weren't as up-to-date. And they didn't know, like, what sorts of tests to order. They didn't know what a material pone was. And so I think... Um, it's really exciting to have this dissemination of knowledge beginning to occur and to raise awareness uh, and that we, you know, becoming our own advocates for our own conditions, especially the neurological, that, you know, if the endocrinological also applies to us, that we raise our voices and, you know, just be aware of the complexities and stand for ourselves, never let ourselves be invalidated if we have an issue and if we have a caregiver who is willing to, you know, take this on, take on this complex case, and be persistent with it, I think will make uh, a really big impact and go really far with that. So I'm very excited for this talk tonight, and thank you for listening. And even if you know this is something that doesn't apply to you and you find out maybe years down the road it might, um, this is something that I feel like has been very, um, I guess, buried. You know, It's not really paramount or upfront when it comes to EDS comorbidities. So. You know, please, um, please listen and just enjoy and keep on being your own advocates and never stop believing. So, thank you. I did also mean to mention that getting put on hydrocortisone for your insufficiency has also changed my life. It is <laughs> remarkable. So, big piece of the puzzle next That is great. Great job, Roman. Thank you. <laughs> And um, I know you've mentioned to me here and there that through your studies, they are bringing up EDS and bringing EDS into the programs and the studies, which is good to hear, which is really good to hear. So I think we have every reason to believe that there's going to be a brighter future. Um, so I am really excited to introduce Dr. Joseph Matthews. Dr. Matthews is a board-certified endocrinologist and medical director of Palmetto Endocrinology. He was born and raised in South Carolina. He earned his Bachelor of Science in Biology from the College of Charleston, cum laude. He then achieved his MD at the Medical University of South Carolina, where he also completed his residency in internal medicine and a fellowship in endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism. While at the Medical University of South Carolina, he served as a chief fellow and helped to initiate the protocol of genetic testing on abnormal thyroid biopsies. Dr. Matthews is also a fellow of both the American College of Endocrinology and the American College of Physicians because of his recognized accomplishments and achievements over and above the practice of medicine and holds certifications to perform leading edge procedures and treatments. 
Specifically, he holds an endocrine certification in neck ultrasound, ECNU, and a certified clinical um, densi densiometrist, densiometrist, <laughs> de den densim densitometrist, densitometrist, okay. <laughs> I should have practiced this. <laughs> He also performs his own ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration biopsies in the comfort of the office and regularly hosts clinical trials to give patients access to the latest treatments available today. His practice includes a range of specializations including prescribing and fitting patients with insulin pumps. Dr. Matthews' practice has drawn patients from out of state to benefit from his ex expertise in thyroid disorders, dis diabetes, cortisol problems, and their endocrine disorders. While he is frequently invited speaker at national conferences across the country regarding various endocrine-related conditions, his heart and home remains in the low country with his wife, two children, and golden retriever in Charleston. <laughs> you have your priorities right. <laughs> the dog's got to be in there. <laughs> Okay, so welcome, Dr. Matthews. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you, everybody. Um, well, tonight, you know, I think is going to be kind of an interesting discussion about, you know, how, you know, some of the, uh, the hormone issues that can arise might be more prevalent in uh, people dealing with EDS. Um, so, of course, what we wanted to try to talk about tonight a little bit, of course, I'm sure we are all very familiar with EDS, its relationship to Chiari. Um, we're going to talk about some of the more common endocrine issues that seem to be showing up in patients that are dealing with EDS. And, you know, what does that mean? What are patients going to be um, kind of feeling, symptoms they may be dealing with, and what we should be kind of thinking about to bring that to the attention of our care team? So what, of course, what is Ehlers-Danlos? You know, it's a connective tissue uh, disorder, right? And we kind of think of connective tissue as the stuff that really supports everything else going on in the body. You know, it gives, it protects it, it gives it structure. Um, and we're learning more and more about the genetics that are, are associated with this disease. A Chiara malformation has been linked to EDS. There seems to be a fair amount of overlap there. Um, sometimes when patients have both of these issues going on simultaneously, it really complicates the Chiari. You know, it, obviously that uh, connective tissue is important for the stabilization of, of uh, the, the skull base and everything going on there. And sometimes when patients have both of these things going on simultaneously, it'll be referred to as complex Chiari as well. All right, well, let's get into the reason why we're here, really the endocrine issues, right? So one of the things we're going to talk about here is the neuroendocrine system. And kind of like the name suggests, neuro meaning kind of brain component, and endocrine is really referencing the chemical signal from one part of the brain to the other. So how is the brain going to communicate to the rest of the body, right, what's going on? Um, so a big part of this kind of, kind of uh, translation happens at the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is going to send signals to the pituitary gland. The pituitary is kind of a pea-sized gland. It's right at the base part of the brain, not technically part of the brain, um, but there's a very intimate connection there. It releases some, some chemical signals to the pituitary gland. And then the pituitary creates these hormones, these chemical signals that travel to the other parts of the body and signal them to do certain things, right? And so here on this uh, sort of graph, we see where the hypothalamus through the pituitary is sending these chemical signals. So the ones we might more commonly think about are TSH going to our thyroid gland. And then the thyroid gland is producing these hormones, T4, T3. That's gonna help regulate our metabolism. We'll kind of touch on that a little bit more as uh, we get kind of further in our discussion tonight. Uh, it produces ACTH, which goes to our adrenal glands on top of our kidneys which stimulates cortisol, and that cortisol helps us respond to stress. So we're gonna to touch on that again uh, a little bit deeper as we move on too. 
uh, FSH and LH, uh, those hormones get released and go to the gonads, the ovaries, the testes, and that helps to produce uh, different sex hormones that help us with development and reproduction. Uh, growth hormone, we don't really have a, a separate uh, kind of endocrine organ that it attaches to, um, but it is responsible for growth. And that's where we're going to probably focus on first. Um, we're going to kind of get more complicated as time goes on, but growth hormone, you know, I think it's a good place to start because why is there a connection between a connective tissue disorder and these endocrine problems? I don't think anybody absolutely knows for sure here. There's probably some genetic component, but connective tissue is surrounding the brain. It's surrounding the pituitary gland. It's giving it support and structure. So it could make sense that if there's a connective tissue issue, it's not giving the proper support that's needed for the pituitary to function correctly, okay? The symptoms of a neuroendocrine disorder vary dramatically, and a lot of that has to do with what end organ is actually being affected? Because all these hormones do different things for us. Um, and we're still learning more and more about, uh, about this all the time. And so a lot of these uh, hormones, we kind of talked about having an, a second organ that it affects. The hormones that don't really have a second organ is growth hormone. That's what we're going to focus on next. But we also think about prolactin. That brings in breast milk after a woman delivers a child. Um, antidiuretic hormone, which helps regulate our sodium and fluid balance as well. That goes directly to the kidney to, to regulate that. But let's go to the growth hormone. So if we're having a problem with our growth hormone, we're going to have a wide swath of different symptoms. A lot of these hormones have fatigue, right? So fatigue is a very common complaint. The issue is it's not very specific. Right? But we're going to feel tired. We're not going to be able to do what we want to do all the time. A little bit more specific to growth hormone, we might see that there's increased body fat. Right? Um, we might have decreased muscle mass. So we think about growth hormone and helping us grow, but as adults, we actually need a certain amount of growth hormone to help maintain our muscle strength. Um, and muscle has a higher metabolic rate, it burns more calories. And so if we don't have enough muscle, we might gain a little more fat, right? Our bones, another kind of connective tissue that we think about, is also reduced when we don't have enough growth hormone. It's a risk factor for developing osteoporosis, where we might thin out our bones, fracture something a lot easier. There's a lot of connection with our, our neuronal kind of uh, input with growth hormone too. We often see patients that are growth hormone deficient have depression. They just don't feel quite right. Um, and their memory is not quite right either. They have problem with concentration. They have problem with memory recall. Um, sometimes, a lot of times, when people are fatigued, they have sexual dysfunction. Their libido is less as well. And so that can be a big quality of life uh, change that happens in our patients too. And kind of tied into the muscle mass, it's also kind of the muscle endurance. Uh, a lot of these folks, unfortunately, just can't keep up uh, and have the stamina that they once had. So the diagnostic challenges, you know, endocrinopathy or endocrine diseases are kind of hard to diagnose a lot of times because a lot of the hormones are in relation to what's going on in our environment. And so we have to sometimes put our bodies into a certain situation or the clinician has to understand what position is this person in and is their body responding correctly, right? So you have to have kind of a high clinical suspicion that something like this might be going on, right? Your clinician has to be kind of thinking about it. And then we have to do the right testing, right? So kind of the blood test that we might think about for growth hormone deficiency is IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one. So growth hormone itself is very pulsatile. So our pituitary gland releases little spurts of it, and it only has half-life, you know, 20 to 30-ish minutes in our body before it's broken down and it's out of our system. Um, IGF-1 is actually a protein produced by our liver, and it is stimulated by growth hormone. And so 
what we can use this for is a surrogate marker of how much growth hormone is being released from the pituitary gland. It has a much longer half-life, so it gives us a better ability to try to measure this and understand that. Um, sometimes I think, you know, uh, patients might be more familiar with a hemoglobin A1C, which represents your blood sugar level over, you know, about a three months. The IGF-1 is kind of like that. It represents your growth hormone level over typically a couple of day kind of period. Sometimes things are in the gray zone. Uh, so an IGF-1 might be on the low normal side, but the patient has all the right clinical signs and symptoms. And so we're thinking, well, maybe there is a growth hormone deficiency, but our blood test is just not really proving that. So we want to do some additional testing to make sure this is the right diagnosis. We have some different kind of tests that help us with this. Um, I had a mentor here at MUSC who um, would always roll up his sleeves and say, endocrinology is provocative medicine. If something's high, we want to suppress it. If something's low, we want to raise it. And so he'd try to, he'd try to fight us sort of idea. Um, can't do that anymore. But back then, <laughs> we could, could kind of get away with that. And so we tried to stimulate growth hormone to see, could this person actually make it if we, if we needed to? So one that's often talked about is an insulin-induced hypoglycemia. Low blood sugar should release growth hormone. This is a dangerous test, though. So we really don't do this anymore. We used to admit patients into the hospital. We would give them a whole lot of insulin and wait for them to get low blood sugar. And then we would check all these blood tests all at once. And then we'd have to give them a lot of sugar to make sure they didn't have a seizure and die. Patients <laughs> actually died from this test. So there's better tests now. But it's still talked about. It's still, I think some institutes still in theory do it. Um, they talk about it anyways. Uh, probably if we have to do this nowadays, we would do a glucagon stimulation test. So glucagon is a uh, the hormone uh, that's released by the pancreas. It stimulates uh, glycogenolysis or sugar release from our liver and our, our kidneys, but it also stimulates growth hormone. And so we could use glucagon much safer uh, to try to see could that stimulate growth hormone for us. The issue with that, though, is that people don't always feel good. Glucagon makes you feel pretty crummy after it's administered. Um, macrolin uh, or macro macimorolin is a ghrelin hormone. Um, and unfortunately, about a year ago, it came off the market. Um, it's all business. Unfortunately, they weren't making enough money, so they kind of stopped producing it. But that was kind of the, the gold standard test that was being used. Um, but hopefully, in the not too distant future, that will be something available again. But sometimes we have to provoke the body to see if it's going to actually respond the way it needs to. Once we kind of confirm that there's a pituitary issue, like growth hormone deficiency, we need to do some imaging. We want to see, is there anything structurally abnormal that could account for what's going on here? Um, so we do typically an MRI of the brain and specifically focusing on the pituitary gland. And sometimes we'll see that there's structural abnormalities there. There might be uh, an adenoma, benign growth, or a Rathke's cleft cyst, so something that, that didn't get absorbed correctly during our fetal development. Um, and why we care is that these things can change over time, and they might cause other issues on the pituitary gland or these other vital structures that are living around our pituitary gland. So once we cross the challenge of making an accurate diagnosis, what can we do about growth hormone deficiency? Um, you know, I think a big goal of what we want to do is get our, our folks feeling better, right? We want to improve our body composition, we want to improve their muscle strength, decrease their fat, uh, increase their exercise capacity, hopefully get their, their mental uh, cognition improved, and then overall improve their quality of life. There is a few small studies out there that might suggest actually improved cardiovascular uh, function with replacing growth hormone. There are also some studies that say it doesn't do that, so it's kind of some conflicting results out there right now, but that is a potential benefit. And we have to give this hormone back. If we don't have enough growth hormone, we need to give it back to folks. And right now, that's kind of like an insulin shot that diabetics might have to take 
it is a it's a protein and so we don't absorb this protein very well if we ingest it orally so we have to do it usually as an injection a subcutaneous and most of the time when we're adults we're doing this as a daily injection there is a problem that we can over replace growth hormone so we have to be careful with that and if that happens naturally endogenously in our own body that's called acromegaly and that can affect our joints. We'll actually get some big joint disease, our hips, our knees get affected with this. Um, and then the bones might start to overgrow, push on certain nerves. And so if the nerves get affected, we'll get this paresthesia, kind of tingling and different issues. And then it can also stimulate us to be too resistant to the hormone insulin. And that might cause some issues, the blood sugar's going up. So we have to be careful with that. There's a kind of relative contraindication that if you have an active cancer, we probably don't want to use this hormone as well. There's no studies to really support this. It's just kind of a theoretical risk that cancers might have a growth hormone receptor and we might stimulate them to grow. So that's one of those things we watch out for as well. All right, so our thyroid. So we're starting to get a, probably a little bit more complex of uh, action here. So. Again, we have a neuroendocrine component with our thyroid. We have our hypothalamus and pituitary communicating to each other. And the pituitary is sending this chemical signal out into our body. And that is our TSH, our thyroid stimulating hormone. Okay? TSH gets released and gets in contact with our thyroid gland that resides in the front part of our neck. Kind of looks like a bow tie or a butterfly. It's from an old, a named from an old Roman shield, where if you look, you know, they, they have this kind of hole at the top and they poke their swords kind of through it so they could attack. But um, once that TSH gets to our thyroid gland, then the receptor is activated and it stimulates additional hormones to be produced. Most of the hormone that gets released from our thyroid gland is a T4. So the four actually stands for four molecules of iodine. T4 then is typically converted into T3. So one of those iodine molecules are plucked off. And it is that T3 hormone that actually seems to be activating the receptors in our body. Okay. Once those receptors are activated, I kind of think of it as our thermostat or the regulator and everything else going on in the body. So in general, the more that receptor is activated, the more things speed up. The less that receptor is activated, the more things tend to slow down. So it controls our metabolic rate. So how much calories are we burning? How fast is our heart beating? You know, how hot are we or cold are we? Um, how quickly is our gut moving? And then of course our neurons require thyroid hormone too, so brain function can be affected with this too. Our bodies, uh, very, very graceful in how it's trying to maintain us in this kind of homeostasis, that after it goes to those body tissues, every tissue in our body has a thyroid hormone receptor, the pituitary gland and hypothalamus actually has receptors as well. And so the more that receptor is activated, the less TSH that gets secreted. And so we have kind of a negative feedback loop that is one of these wonderful endocrine things that you know, we all get excited about. Um, but in general, it tries to keep us balanced, right? So the more hormone we have, the less pituitary hormone we have, and vice versa. So if we have thyroid hormone dysregulation, you know, this, the dysfunction can happen in a couple different spots. It can happen from the pituitary gland or the hypothalamus not creating that TSH correctly. That's a pretty rare thing. Um, and we call that kind of tertiary or sometimes secondary. Um, but more commonly, we see that this is probably a primary gland problem, whereas the thyroid gland itself is not responding to that TSH the way it might, might normally should. And the symptoms, again, depend a little bit on, well, is there too much hormone or is there too little, right? There does seem to be a pretty strong genetic predisposition to this. Um, we see that it's almost affecting eight to one female to male. We tend to see it runs in families pretty strongly too. Um, the latest uh, numbers I saw was probably 40% uh, chance that if your parent had it, your, your offspring will have a thyroid condition as well. 
So if we kind of break this up into the two sides of having too much would be hyperthyroidism or versus not having enough hypothyroidism. So in hyper, everything's gonna be speeding up for us. So we might be more anxious. Uh, we might be more irritable, right? Our heart's gonna be beating probably faster. So there might be more palpitations and issues there. Uh, we're gonna be burning off our calories a lot faster and we're gonna use that energy as heat. So we might get hot easier. And as we're burning up calories, we're gonna be burning up fast. So we're gonna actually start losing weight. And unfortunately, we'll start to lose muscle strength and muscle mass with this condition as well. Our gut speeds up, so we might get kind of a diarrhea or increased bowel movement frequency. Again, fatigue is common with all these endocrine issues, unfortunately, so that, that is in here as well. Um, our hair might not grow as fast. Um, and then women will have menstrual issues with this condition as well. Hypothyroidism is almost the exact opposite on several of these things. Like instead of having anxiety, we might have more of a depression. Instead of having too fast a heart rate, we're gonna to have too slow a heart rate. Instead of being hot all the time, we might be cold all the time. Instead of losing weight, we might gain weight. Instead of having diarrhea, we might have constipation. We're gonna have fatigue with this condition as well. We're gonna have hair loss with this condition as well. And then women can also have menstrual irregularity with this too. So what are the diagnostic challenges? Again, you gotta have the clinician have the right clinical suspicion. What are the symptoms? Do they fit into a picture that might, might be this condition? And so then we gotta do some testing to help confirm that this is indeed what's going on. So we typically do blood testing. We wanna look at that TSH value. And that's gonna help us understand how well is the pituitary gland communicating to the thyroid gland. We're gonna look at the hormones coming out of the thyroid gland, our T4 and our T3. There's different ways to measure that. There's lots of different blood test measurements there. Um, so my personal favor are looking at the free T4, the free T3 levels. These are what's probably gonna be the active kind of hormone that's available to be uh, used in the body more accurately. And we got great blood tests that measure that very accurately for us as well now. If there's a high enough suspicion if something's not going right, we might wanna do some additional blood tests to look at this too. Most of the time, the most common issues that are gonna arise with the thyroid are autoimmune in nature. And so we're gonna look at different antibodies that could be sticking to various proteins and enzymes that are residing inside our thyroid gland. So that's the TPO or thyroid peroxidase antibody. That's our thyroglobulin antibody. Those tend to be associated with causing inflammation and destruction within the gland. We have our thyroid receptor antibody. So this is normally what the TSH hormone attaches to. And so it might attach to it just right that it activates the thyroid gland to turn on. And so that's associated with hyperthyroidism. We're making too much hormone. A very similar uh, antibody to that is our TSI, or thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin. Sometimes patients are communicating okay from their pituitary to their thyroid. Sometimes their thyroid gland is making an okay amount of thyroid hormone for us, T4. But sometimes our body's not converting that T4 into T3 correctly for us. And so if we have concern for that, sometimes we could measure a hormone called reverse T3. And so when you pluck that iodine off of that T4 hormone, it could be on one side, it could be on the mirror image, the opposite side. And that does not, that opposite hormone, it's called reverse T3, doesn't seem to activate our thyroid hormone receptors the same way as our normal T3 does. So that is something we could actually measure and might give us a clue into what might be going on there. Depending on what's going on, we might need to do some imaging as well to help kind of understand the, the accurate diagnosis. And so thyroid ultrasound is frequently used. We want to see structurally, what does the thyroid gland look like? Is there inflammation present? Is there a nodule there that we would need to know about that might be uh, acting funny? And depending, we might need to do a nuclear medicine thyroid uptake. So the idea with this test is we actually administer iodine. And that iodine is taken up by a thyroid gland to try to make the hormone for us. And then we take a picture of the thyroid gland and we see, well, how much iodine did it actually take up? And where did it take it up? 
Is it kind of diffuse or is it focal in one spot? That gives us an idea of how the thyroid gland can be functioning. So once we kind of confirm our diagnosis, we want to fix it, right? So the goals, of course, are going to be to get the symptoms better. But we also see that thyroid hormone really affects the cardiovascular system as well. And so it can affect our heart muscle directly. So we can see that if we don't have enough thyroid hormone, that the heart muscle might not contract and squeeze the blood as strongly as it should. Or if it stimulates too much, it might go into overdrive and go into atrial fibrillation, which is a bad horror, then that can actually cause strokes. We also see that it affects our cholesterol levels and our lipid levels. And so it increases the risk of myocardial infarction or stroke cerebrovascular disease. So depending on which side of the coin the thyroid gland might be functioning, if we're on the hyper side, then there's medicines that we can actually use that inhibits the production of thyroid hormone for us. And so we think about methemazole, sometimes abbreviated as MMI, or propothiouracil, abbreviated as PTU. The good thing about these medicines is that if this is autoimmune, there's a chance that you could go into remission, typically about 40% in that first year. Um, but there are always side effects to medicines, right? So that's where we have to be careful with this. So. These medicines are metabolized by our liver, and so it can cause hepatotoxicity, liver damage. We have to monitor that. Um, it can suppress our immune system as well, and so we might be more apt to uh, get a, a bacterial infection that we can't treat accurately. So we have to monitor for that, for that while you're on therapy. We have definitive treatments that we can do for folks as well. Um, radioactive iodine. So we've been talking about iodine. Um, instead of giving an iodine that just kind of shows up on our camera, we actually give you an iodine that destroys the tissue, that sucks it up. So it's kind of, kind of like a heat-seeking missile, right? So you give that iodine, it's sucked up by a thyroid gland, not much other tissue sucks up much iodine, which is good, but then that radiation actually destroys the tissue. There's a chance that you might not need to take medicine for this after that treatment. However, we are exposing you to radiation. So radiation can cause DNA mutations. DNA mutations could lead to cancer. So we do have to be cognizant of secondary cancers with that sort of, uh, sort of treatment. Surgery is the other option where you actually surgically remove your thyroid gland. It is kind of a major surgery, so you do have to be ready for that type of surgery. And oftentimes we treat with medicine preoperatively to make sure you're safe for that. But that is an option too. If you have surgery, you wouldn't have a gland to make hormone for you. So you will be hypothyroid after the fact. So that kind of flips us over into what happens if you're not making enough thyroid hormone, hypothyroidism. Well, if you don't have enough, we need to give it back to you. So it's thyroid hormone replacement, right? We have several different options on thyroid hormone replacement. Lefothyroxin is the standard of care, and that is the T4 hormone that is the main hormone that comes out of our thyroid gland. Sometimes, if things are not functioning correctly, we might have to add leothyronine, which is the T3 thyroid hormone, um, and sometimes we need to do a combination of both of those hormones. There are lots of different manufacturers of levothyroxine on the market, and so the active ingredient is the same in all of these, but they have different pill binders, different things that they, the company will put in it that typically makes it, make it its own formulation. And so sometimes that can affect the absorption. And so one manufacturer might work well for one person. It might not work as well for another person. And so it's going to be important to kind of communicate symptoms to whoever's helping you with this because uh, that could be something that might need to be adjusted and changed. Adjusting the dosage is a combination of how well is your body responding to the hormone and then what are the blood levels looking like. So it's kind of a marriage between those two different things. All right, so we're getting a lot more complicated. So we're, this is going to be our, uh, <laughs> our most complicated kind of uh, hormone we'll talk about tonight, the adrenal glands. All right, so... We kind of mentioned a little bit about the neuroendocrine component, our, our uh, uh, 
you know, hypothalamus talking to the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland creating that chemical signal and hormone into the body, which is ACTH. Okay, ACTH gets in the bloodstream, attaches to our adrenal glands. Our adrenal glands kind of stick like hats on top of our, our kidneys, right? So renal, kidney, add next to adrenal, right? Um, that ACTH produces or stimulates cortisol release. Okay, cortisol is a stress hormone. So it helps us regulate our blood pressure. Um, it helps us regulate our immune response. It helps us regulate our blood sugar level as well. It typically it raises our blood sugar to try to give us more energy. So, you know, if we have a bear chasing us, we're gonna release cortisol, and that's hopefully going to give us more blood sugar that we can run away faster, give our muscles what it needs to, to do that. And then if we, when we trip and fall, because naturally, you know, um, and we scrape ourselves, <laughs> then our immune system is gonna be ready so it can fight off whatever infection might happen, right? Um, and then, kind of like the thyroid, we have a negative feedback. Our hypothalamus, our pituitary gland is going to sense how much of that cortisol is circulating. It's going to help interpret that to understand, is that what we need? Is that normal? And help regulate that ACTH release. Okay. We also have the RAS system, the RAS system, which is uh, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone uh, system. And so that's not really modulated and regulated through our pituitary gland. It's a multi kind of system, uh, kind of uh, graceful sort of uh, process where the adrenal glands produce aldosterone. Aldosterone then goes predominantly to the kidneys. And then the kidneys regulate the sodium and potassium balance through aldosterone depending on what the kidneys are sensing on our volume status, how much fluid is inside our veins, and our salt, how much sodium is inside our blood, it will release renin. Renin then has to go to the liver. And at the liver, it converts a protein, angiotensin, a tens tensinogen, into angiotensin 1, right? Then angiotensin floats around to our lungs, once it's in the lungs, we have another enzyme that converts angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. And then angiotensin 2 goes to the adrenal gland and stimulates aldosterone release, right? So we have to have good liver, we have to have good kidneys, we have to have good lungs for all this to work properly. Um, so it's pretty complicated, um, but it, if we have problems with blood pressure, sodium and potassium balance, that might kind of clue us in that something's going to be running amok there. We're not probably going to focus too much on that because that doesn't sound, seem to be a very common issue that folks with EDS seem to be presenting with right now. We also have adrenaline. A lot of folks are kind of familiar with adrenaline because we got scared and our body will release adrenaline gives us kind of that, that rush, right? It speeds up our heart, raises our blood pressure. That tends to be more kind of brain directly to adrenal gland through the autonomic nervous system. And I know we've had some discussions in this uh, forum before about dysautonomia. All right, so we're gonna focus on the cortisol predominantly. All right, so the dysfunction can occur at multiple different points, right? Kind of like our thyroid where it could be a pituitary gland problem, it could be a hypothalamic problem, or it could be a specific adrenal gland problem. Um, again, the symptoms really depend on having too much or too little of this hormone circulating in our body. Um, and what we're probably seeing, at least I'm seeing in my practice right now, is that it's more of a secondary adrenal insufficiency in folks dealing with EDS. And so that is where the hypothalamus and or pituitary is not stimulating the adrenal glands as much as we would normally want them to do. So what sort of symptoms might happen if a patient does not have enough cortisol? Fatigue, right? So that's kind of a common thing. But what might be a little bit more telling is that this fatigue might be more prevalent under stress, right? Cortisol is a stress response. And so if you get stressed and you can't respond to that stress adequately, or you kind of, you know, sometimes patients say they crash, right? They just sleep for days after uh, the stressful event. 
that might be a little bit more specific for, for cortisol. Our muscles will be weak. Uh, we'll tend to lose weight, not always, but we'll tend to lose weight. Um, we'll have abdominal pain. You know, hard to know what causes this abdominal pain, but it might be kind of a gastroparesis kind of condition as well that's associated with not having enough cortisol. Um, we might get sick enough that we'll start to get so nauseous, we might actually start to vomit. Uh, sometimes we'll get kind of pro-motility in our lower uh, GI system, we'll get more of a diarrhea issue. A lot of folks will have irritability and often depression associated with this. Again, as we're fatigued and we're, we're not feeling good, we'll tend to have lower libido. Um, our blood sugar levels will also be affected commonly with, um, with low cortisol levels. So that's, that could be a big clue into what's going on. One of the things we also worry about is adrenal crisis. And so if we get stressed enough and then something else is going on, we might not be able to raise our blood pressure enough to adequately get that blood and oxygen to all the organs in our body that need it. And that could cause a shock issue. Um, a lot of times our brain might not be getting enough blood, might not be getting enough blood sugar, and we'll get confused. Uh, sometimes people actually lose consciousness with this. Um, the nausea, the vomiting, diarrhea could be so severe, people get dehydrated with this, and that also compounds everything else that's going on. Very frequently, we'll see a low sodium level or hyponatremia with this condition as well, and that can be a clue. It can be pretty dangerous. Uh, we see that probably about 8% per year of folks um, with adrenal insufficiency will have an adrenal crisis. If you have an adrenal crisis, mortality risk is about 8% as well. And so a lot of times that is just because it's not being recognized for the condition that it is, and the patient unfortunately is not getting the proper replacement of the hormone they're deficient in. And so what can these adrenal crisis triggers be? Pretty much anything that causes stress. It could be a physical stress, right? You sprain your ankle, you fall down the stairs, you have a surgery, right? Or maybe you have an infection. Maybe you caught COVID 2.0 or caught the flu. Um, and then emotional stress as well. So maybe you had a death in the family. I've seen all these things trigger enough of a response in folks that it causes a true adrenal crisis. And so what are the diagnostic challenges, right? Cortisol's tricky. Um, you know, it's kind of like thyroid hormone. Every tissue in our body has a cortisol or a glucocorticoid receptor. And so we have multi-organ system dysfunction. And so sometimes if you're seeing one specialist that just focuses on a single organ system, they might not see the big picture of everything else going on. So the clinician that you're seeing has to have that kind of uh, clinical suspicion present, right? We wanna do some blood testing to try to diagnose this as well. So we're gonna look at the communication between the hypothalamus, pituitary, and the adrenal gland. So we look at that ACTH level. We look at the cortisol level. We typically, uh, in my practice, like to look at DHEAS or DHEA sulfate levels. You know, DHEA sulfate is stimulated by the ACTH hormone. It also has a nice longer half-life. So it's almost like that IGF-1 that we look at for growth hormone, or that hemoglobin A1C that we can look at for diabetics that gives us that overall amount of that communication between these two glands. This is a lot easier said than done, right? So cortisol has a diurnal variation. Our body naturally peaks its cortisol around eight o'clock in the morning for us to kind of help probably get us ready for our day. And so depending on what time of day these levels get checked, they're gonna be different. It's gonna vary on our current health status. So if we are stressed, normally we'd expect to have higher cortisol levels. If we're nice and relaxed, we would normally expect to have some lower cortisol levels. Other medications can affect this too. And so if we're having joint issues, sometimes we'll get joint injections of steroids to try to reduce inflammation. And that steroid is actually picked up by the body and sensed by the pituitary gland, and that is going to affect how the pituitary gland responds. So other medications can certainly affect this. 
Opioid pain medications also significantly affect how the pituitary gland functions. And so very often, this is not a simple one blood test and we have a diagnosis. We have to be provocative, right? We're gonna have to roll up our sleeves and, and fight to try to stimulate, can we actually make cortisol? So the gold standard test for this is called an ACTH stimulation test. So what we do with this test is we actually administer the ACTH, which is that pituitary hormone, to the patient. And we measure how much cortisol is that patient actually able to make and produce. Typically, depends on the protocol you follow, 30, 60, 90 minutes after that administration. There's lots of nuance to this as well. Most of the time, when you do an ACTH simulation, it's considered a standard dose. Why is it standard? Because the bottle that the ACTH comes in is 250 micrograms. And so that's what's given to the patient. 250 micrograms is a very supra-physiologic dose. That is a heck of a lot more than your body would probably ever make. And so if you have kind of an early secondary adrenal insufficiency, it might not pick that up correctly. And why is that? So if you are making just a little bit of ACTH, you might be stimulating your adrenal glands just a little bit. And so you might have enough function within your adrenal glands that if you hit them with a big hammer, they're going to make cortisol for you. Okay, so it's possible to be missed on a standard test, sometimes in these early disease onsets. So there's something called a low-dose ACTH stimulation test that can be done, where we try to use a more physiologic ACTH level. Um, that's not commonly done, but it, it can be. Um, and it's not commonly done because you have to dilute that, that sample down, 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 down. And so you have to have a person who knows how to dilute samples and do it correctly to actually uh, do that test. Um, what we tend to do more in our outpatient setting is something called a meteropone stimulation test. Um, again, not frequently done nowadays because it's kind of an, an older, older test, but this might be a more sensitive test in picking up early or partial secondary adrenal insufficiency. Meteropone actually inhibits the last step in our adrenal glands in producing cortisol. So what ends up happening is that when you take this pill, we ask you to take that around 11 p.m. midnight, your cortisol level should drop out completely. You should not be making any cortisol. What should happen is that your pituitary gland and your hypothalamus senses that and it tries to turn on the cortisol. Your ACTH levels should go up. When your ACTH levels go up, it should stimulate your adrenal glands to actually try to make cortisol. So we measure the precursor hormone before cortisol, and we look to see, does it make enough of it? If it does, we think that you probably have adequate pituitary hypothalamic function that if stimulated, you could make your cortisol. But if not, that kind of fits the picture that you have a secondary uh, adrenal insufficiency. When we diagnose this, we want to look at imaging, right? We want to look at the structure of the hypothalamus and pituitary again. Is there anything else going on that could account for why this is, why this is present? Because if there is something structural, it could progress and could cause other problems. And that's something we need to be aware of. So what do we do once we make a diagnosis? Well, we typically want to replace the hormone that's deficient, so we replace the cortisol. Um, and the goals of our treatment are trying to alleviate the symptoms, of course. We want to improve energy levels. We want to get our muscle strength back. We want to improve our cognition. Um, but also importantly, we want to prevent adrenal crisis because in preventing adrenal crisis, we will prevent a mortality, right? So patients should not hopefully pass away from this condition. There are different ways to give this cortisol back to folks. So we usually start with oral, kind of a pill form of this medication. Um, there's lots of different steroids out there. I'm sure we have probably all been exposed to steroids. 
Hydrocortisone is the most or the closest uh, to what our own adrenal glands are making as far as cortisol goes. It does have a short half-life, so it's out of our system faster, so we have to dose it multiple times a day, and so that could be a challenge. Sometimes we'll use prednisone, which has a longer duration of action in our body, but sometimes we just don't break it down the right way. Uh, dexamethasone and methylprednisolone are other options, again, but we might not be processing that hormone or that steroid quite right. So it's not a one kind of fits all kind of picture. Sometimes we'll have absorption issues. Sometimes our gut doesn't absorb these hormones correctly either. And so we might have to give it outside the gut, either as an IM injection. Frequently, if there is adrenal crisis occurring and there's the nausea, the vomiting, diarrhea, you can't get anything oral in, uh, these these patients, we advise them to have kind of an intramuscular injection of the steroid to kind of bring them out of that condition. Sometimes we'll do this as an IV if somebody's in the hospital and they can't eat or take anything by mouth. Or sometimes in the outpatient setting, we can do this as a subcutaneous, kind of like an insulin shot or through a kind of an insulin pump sort of idea to administer this, this hormone. Um, a big part of adrenal insufficiency is stress dosing. So nothing's quite like homemade. So if we get stressed, our body should make more cortisol, help us respond to that stress, and it's probably gonna make just the right amount of cortisol for what we need. If we have adrenal insufficiency, our body's not gonna do that for us. So we have to be smart, and we have to try to figure out, well, I'm stressed, I'm taking a test, I am driving up the, the East Coast and traffic and 18-wheeler is gonna push me off the road. I might need a little extra cortisol to help me respond to that stress. Um, there's no hard science right now to say the one dose or this dose is the absolute right thing to do. So it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis. How does your body respond? What kind of dosing are you requiring? So that's something to kind of work with your clinician with if something like that is going on. We also have to be cognizant of over-replacement. So if we have too much cortisol in our system, if it's endogenous, our own body's doing it, or we're accidentally doing it, we call it sometimes Cushing's syndrome, or hypercortisolism. And so that might stimulate too much weight gain. That might make us really tired. Again, not enough, too much makes us tired, Con common symptom. Um, it stimulates sebum and oil production from our skin, so we might develop acne. Um, it actually thins out our skin, and so we might start to bruise easier. It actually starts to break down our muscles, so we'll get muscle weakness and muscle wasting. Um, we'll start to not have our heart function as well and our kidneys function as well, so we'll start to get swelling or edema. Our brain is going to be not functioning correctly. Our um, neurotransmitters are going to be misfiring, so it might be more irritable or have depression or anxiety. Um, cortisol regulates your immune system. And if we have a constantly elevated cortisol, it could actually suppress our immune system. We could get sick and not fight things off as well. And it tries to raise our blood sugar. And so if we have too much constantly, we might develop a diabetes sort of, sort of situation. So we have to be careful with that. So it is definitely a fine balance. So I think, you know, what are the things we want to think about as a patient? Um, I think really finding a good clinician that is going to be part of your healthcare team is a big aspect to this. And so you want to have a good open communication. I think that is going to be a big thing. Um, you want to make sure things are being tested multiple times because we're very dynamic systems. We're constantly changing. Our environment around us is constantly changing and our body is adapting to that. And so sometimes it takes testing over and over to really nail down the right diagnosis. As part of our constantly dynamic changing body, it might be good to keep track of our symptoms. How do they change over time? What might be a trigger for these symptoms? And so using different health applications and uh, things like that and what medicines you're taking could help kind of unmask what's really going on under the surface. What I really like about these sort of devices that are out there now is it offers this historical perspective, and if you have a clinician that's really in tune, that's, that you're in good communication with, 
you know, looking over this data together might help unmask those triggers and what might be helpful. I think um, making sure that you're open with your symptoms is also very important. You know, I, I think, you know, Roman talking earlier was, you know, doctors didn't know what to do, right? In our training, there was not a lot of knowledge about this condition at the time. And so making sure that you're open about your symptoms, that they're aware of what's going on, I think is going to be very important. And then also, I think, learning more about it. You know, we talked about the different research aspects that are needed, but I think attending lectures like these and just understanding, well, what symptoms do I need to be on the lookout for is also going to be very important. So overall, in summary, you know, we touched on the fact that connective tissue helps to support all these other organ systems in our body, including our, our hypothalamus and our pituitary gland. Unfortunately, Ehlers-Danlos is a genetic condition that affects our connective tissue, and it is frequently associated with Chiari malformation. And there seems to be some more common endocrine issues that seem to be presenting themselves in patients dealing with EDS, um, and we're seeing that on the neuroendocrine side where the pituitary is not functioning correctly. We see that on the autoimmune side with thyroid disease, and on the adrenal side tends to be a very common issue with this as well. So I think having a high clinical suspicion is going to be important. You have to be thinking about these issues. And then you have to do the right testing to help make sure we're on the right track. And then I think having a very important, active, healthy relationship with your clinician to make sure you're getting the right care is going to be very important. So thank you all.